Hello and welcome back to Cooking the Books with me, Jilly Smith, the podcast which digs just a little deeper into the minds behind the best of the food books through four food moments. This week we're talking about one of the most beautiful books I've read this year, The Year of Miracles by Ella Risbridger. Like her first book, Midnight Chicken and Other Recipes Worth Living For, it's part novel, part recipe book, and despite not meaning to be a book about grief, it's soaked in it, in a good way. She describes grief like an anvil crashing through the floor, revealing a whole new level where you can live. And where she lives is a really interesting place, which questions a whole way of being. We expect people to make a lot of sacrifices for one usually heterosexual romantic relationship. We expect that to be the pinnacle on which everything turns. And the kind of the more sacrifices you make for that one relationship and that one person, the more important it is and the better it is. And I, I've done that. I tried. It made me very unhappy and I think it makes a lot of people unhappy. I began by asking her, after being dubbed the new Nigella, what she wanted to achieve with this one. I mean, I think the interesting thing about this book is that I, I sold it and pitched it as a book about sort of dinner parties. And uh, I sold it just after my then partner died. And it was very much like, no, grief won't define me. I'm going to write this book about parties and people. And I think the interesting thing about grief is that you can kind of muffle it if you want to with people. You can kind of surround yourself with people who love you and want fun things for you. You know, I don't know. I think I probably grieved in quite an unorthodox way because I went out quite a lot. I did a lot of self-distraction. And I think, as with many people, the pandemic kind of forced us to sit with things a little bit more and sit with things differently. I mean, I think people are still kind of sitting with things differently and saying things differently. And I think one thing I had absolutely loved about surrounding myself with so many people, you know, I have amazing friends. John had wonderful friends. I am lucky enough to have an incredible family who, you know, when I worked out in 2020, we had 19 people to stay in January and February. So before the pandemic. And that was such a huge thing for me was never being alone. And obviously in the kind of deep lockdown, which is This isn't a book about the pandemic. I feel really strongly that it's not a book about the pandemic. You will notice the word pandemic never occurs anywhere in it, nor does the word disease, virus, vaccine, lockdown, which is a really conscious choice. Um, But it did make me sit with what I was writing a bit differently. And it made me sit with how I was living a bit differently. Because, of course, there was only me and my flatmate. And while we are very close... Sometimes you did need a bit of time on your own. It was like, well, we really have spent every single minute together for the last (laughs) six weeks. Perhaps I will go into the kitchen and be on my own. And I think particularly it was a big shift from being a cook and a writer, which is a lot of alone time. So I had to kind of get into a sort of more stable rhythm of learning to kind of be inside and think about what I was thinking about. And I think then it became very clear that the book was always going to be about grief. And that was really interesting for me as I had decided very firmly that I decided with my publishers that that was not what we were going to do next. You know, it, it's, a, it's a book that it has a narrative arc. It is uh, called The Year of Miracles. And we'll talk about those miracles a bit later. But it is a, a process of recovery. It, was, it always had to be. It's about starting life again, isn't it? It's about feeding yourself from the foods and the fruits that you're growing yourself. It's very nourishing. Is that how you pitched it? What was, what was the 60 word pitch? What happened was I'd written a piece of The Guardian about friendship after my then partner died and how sustaining I'd found it and how nourishing I'd found it and how I had found it to be a family in a way and to be every bit as crucial and satisfying as kind of traditional romantic relationships. And I think I've never written anything that people have responded to more. You know, I know somebody had it at their wedding. I know lots of people for whom it means an awful lot, that piece of writing. And that really made me think, wow, okay, there are a lot of people who are also trying to figure out whether it's possible to build a life where you don't put your romantic partner, and I kind of mean romance in a very traditional sense there, the kind of, you know, hearts and sex and flowers business, above all other things. And so that was kind of the heart of the book I pitched Bloomsbury. And I think it's, I hope, sincerely hope it's still at the heart of this book now well it is because it it 
I mean, it feels to me, I, I mean, I think I, I said in my Instagram post about it, it felt very sort of Bridget Jones, except that you get everything right. But, you know, that lovely sense of, you know, friends coming in. And, and of course, it was in lockdown, but there's a, po- a point in it. And we're, it's one of your food moments, actually, where you're all in this, you know, blow up paddling pool in the brief you know, space between lockdown. And you're just doing that thing that young people do and that somehow never really happens again in your life my daughters are 23 and 26 and they're doing it now and I'm kind of reliving that with them and it's a wonderful time in your life I don't know I think that's a really interesting point that you say it doesn't happen again because I am 30 and the youngest by quite a long way of people in this book which you know my friends are between 30 and 50 and mostly I have some younger and some older they're not ruling anyone out who's listening to this podcast but I think it is a choice. It is a conscious choice to centre friendship in that way, to centre joy in that way. And I I really kind of push against this idea that it will never come again, because I tried really hard to be a grown-up. I tried really hard to do a very domestic, very settled life. And, you know, if you've read Midnight Chicken, you'll see that there's a very there was a very settled life. But what Midnight Chicken doesn't say is how hard that was for me and how much healthier and better I find it to be surrounded by people who love me in lots of different ways. You know, I am lucky enough to be in a wonderful romantic relationship now. I love him very much, but also I love my friends and I love what is important to me in my life. And what I really hope kind of comes through in this book is this sense of kind of it being more balanced. Midnight Chicken was very much a love story. And the interesting thing about Midnight Chicken is, of course, I wrote it when John was dying. I wrote it completely, basically, in hospital corridors and chapels and, you know, little church cafes opposite the hospital and parks. And it does, to me, still have a kind of elegiac quality almost. That's a bit vain to say about your own work, isn't it? But it... (laughs) I You're was allowed. writing it very much as a as an epitaph, really, as a kind of tribute to, to that one way of living, which even as I was writing was over. And I think in some ways that's a quality I really like about lots of books. You know, I think the best children's books, for instance, have a real sense of that, oh, childhood is fleeting and I'm already out of it. And, you know, the best romance novels have this sense of these tiny moments And I think the premise of this book was kind of, what if you expand that out? What if that feeling of joy could be made to last by by not predicating it so much on one single person, on sharing it, on, you know, freedom's a big word, but like on making sure everyone's got the space to blossom. You know, I don't know if you're a gardener, but there's this really brutal thing where you can't have, you can't put out all the seedlings if you don't have space. Everything. If you do that, everything's going to die. You need to space out the plants you put in the garden. You need to space out your seeds. And I'm not a very good gardener. I expect a lot of people who listen to this are very keen gardeners and have, in fact, a garden <laughs> rather than a sort of parking space. And I hope that's I hope that's what the book is about. It's about spacing stuff out and having having lots of people rather than just one. Yeah, and and I think that that may have to do with fear as well. Putting all your eggs in one basket uh, is not a great idea. It's not at all linked to fear for me. And that is one of the things that I get most stressed about is the idea that people think that it's somehow, I don't know, we expect people to make a lot of sacrifices for one usually heterosexual romantic relationship. We expect that to be the pinnacle on which everything turns. And the kind of the more sacrifices you make for that one relationship and that one person, the more important it is and the better it is. And I, I've done that. I tried. It made me very unhappy. And I think it makes a lot of people unhappy. I just, I don't think it's fair. I think it's, and I find it a little bit, not quite insulting, but I find it a little bit strange that people think that the reason to love more people is because you are scared to love one. It doesn't get less scary. It's always a leap of faith. 
I just think that we can take those leaps of faith with our friends. I think that, you know, friendship has become a really interesting talking point uh, since lockdown. I think people have made a lot of conscious decisions about who their friends are and how they want to be friends with people. Um, personally, I've stopped sowing my seeds quite so wildly. I've been much more uh, conscious about p putting more into the few really wonderful friendships that I have and, and spending less time kind of going out and having a, a, a wilder time and just being much more with my friends. But I know people who've done completely the opposite and, and all variations of it. It's a very interesting time to go inner. And I want to just focus a little bit on the inner because there's a lot of observations that are very profound, obviously, about grief, but about a lot of other stuff just you talk about filling spaces and uh and magical things you talk about the kaleidoscope of grief for example which is about the fragments of of thoughts and memories and colors and and things that can only come from a very vivid imagination and that takes a moment to set aside to, to be by yourself can you talk a little bit about that how how you wrote them down you say you, you were looking through a jewel at the world the, the fractals i love that idea that part i mean if looking through a jewel at the world is literally how it felt to me i have a very i have a sort of quite unruly mind and it literally felt like i was looking through a jewel you know when i look at my memories particularly of the first year after john died i have so few concrete memories of anything i have little flashes little a little tiny snatches and also in the uh, year leading up to his death I have well I had so I have PTSD which I don't really like to talk about very much because it feels very private to me but that I see in kind of very vivid and I think the PTSD thing kind of gives you these flashbacks right these incredible traumatizing flashbacks which are totally debilitating or work like I'm pretty great I'm so great now mentally I'm so recovered basically all of the time but they were an incredibly useful tool for writing about stuff and what once I learned to lean into them it this book took me a really long time to write and it was really hard to do it really took it out of me writing this book I would say I finished it a year ago maybe a little no longer longer than a year ago and I would say it's only now that I'm really starting to write again properly but a lot of that was because I was fighting the way I remembered it. I was trying to make the narrative more kind of story-like, more compelling. And I know we said we're talking a little while about the fact it's written through a year, but giving in to the idea that I wanted to write this as a seasonal, as a year, and giving myself the kind of license to do that was very freeing. There's a little note at the start of the book, which is probably well, my favourite bit in the book. I'm just going to grab it. Um which is, this is a memoir, which is to say it's a kind of fiction. It's what happened as it happened to me and not as it happened to anyone else. Some events have been compressed. Most names have been changed. And once I gave myself permission to use, to say that, to say it's fiction, I made it up. Uh, you know, I didn't make it up is what I remember, but I was so consumed with trying to tell the absolute truth in a way that nobody could argue with that, yeah, it was paralyzing. And so once I started being able to write about things as I saw them through this kind of kaleidoscope or this jewel or this prism, you know, when I was a kid, my granny had this, you know, the kaleidoscope and you like spin the end and the little beads all rattle around and you can kind of see the different light and shadow that's mm. happening around, yeah. but you can't see, you can't see things. You just see flashes of color and kind of looking at stuff through a jewel, you know, with the many facets and you kind of catch the light and you catch this burst of color and you catch this face maybe in like weird sharp relief. And that I think was giving myself permission to write in the way that I had seen the world and continue really to see the world. You know, I don't think <laughs> it's very hard to know if your mind ever really goes back to how it was before. I'm certainly completely changed as a person because of uh, John's life and John's death and grieving John. And I think maybe it sort of just broke my brain a little bit. It broke my brain so that now I find it very difficult to see things not through this kaleidoscope. I would say now I have a much better grasp of what's going on than I did you know in the first year two years really after John's death it was a total whirl of no idea what's going on yeah. and the same goes for the years in which he was dying and I was looking after him total whirl total chaos and I think I hope that I've managed to convey 
the way that grief kind of breaks you and remakes you. And I don't know, I I worry sometimes about making it seem like it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's not good and it's not bad. It just is. And that comes over very clearly. And one of the other things that you say is that you write yourself real. You don't use that phrase, but you, you write to give yourself edges. Um, and it, and it yeah. feels like, the, you know, that kaleidoscopic kind of view, world view is drawn together as you try to make sense of stuff that feels very organic and very, um, very emotional, actually. And and you talk about how John was a very visible person and he, wherever he went, he was very sort of overwhelming. And I know from previous relationships what that was like to feel invisible compared to your partner. With him gone, y- your writing is making you visible through Midnight Chicken, but even more so with this process of, of, of writing yourself real. Can you explain that process? I don't remember a time before I wrote. I've never had a backup plan. I found the internet quite early. I was blogging and I was like oh right so this is how I'm going to make a living through this so even from a tiny kid when I was really little I used to write blurbs of my own books I never I didn't really write stories like other kids unless I had to but I used to write like blurbs what I now realize is a proposal it has always been what I did I have always written and I've always written about myself always I've always got a diary it's not like a sit down every night and write my leather bound diary but I always have I always have a notebook and I write in it every day you know, it's to-do lists and it's shopping and it's baking and it's, you know, recipes and it's ideas and it's thoughts and it's things I see and like drawings of people I see on the bus. I don't know what I would do without it. I think when I don't write, I end up feeling very drifty and unsure. I have an incredibly wonderful long-term therapist and I truly recommend that everyone listening to this get a therapist. Even if you don't think you need to, you'll have a great time. But I said to my therapist that one, I've realised that the reason I go to therapy is to unlearn telling myself stories about myself. I Most people go to therapy to learn to trust themselves and I go because my instincts can't be trusted. My instinct is to make a narrative out of everything. And I think, so I do write myself real, but that also requires me to kind of con- constantly be involved in this process of unwriting myself. You know, I'm so proud of what this book is now and I'm so proud of the shapes it's taken But once I gave myself permission to tell a story, not to tell every story, not to tell every possible story, and to sit with the possibility that my recollection is fuzzy or my recollection is wrong or I didn't do the right thing. I don't know, earlier you said a Bridget Jones who always gets things right and I feel that I really have not got things right. I feel, you know, giving myself permission to write about myself as a person who is sometimes quite horrible and doesn't get everything right. You know, there's another section in the book that I really worry about and I still worry about where I talk about, it's in the Turkish eggs chapter, where I talk about how John being dead means that I can choose the cafe. And it was, I dithered a lot about putting that in. I dithered, I went back and forth because it's, it's brutal to be like, well, one upside of the person I loved more than anything in the world being dead is that I don't have to go to a greasy spoon. I can in fact go and get Turkish eggs and Turkish coffee. And I wanted to kind of show in the book how complicated things are. And that wasn't probably a nice emotion for me to feel. But also, it was true that he was in a wheelchair and didn't have a lot of time left to live. So I really just suck it up and go to the greasy spoon. (laughs) And I wanted to convey the complexity of of getting things wrong and being not always your best self and how how being in difficult situations and grieving and pandemics and lockdowns and don't always bring out the best in people including me I worry sometimes that so many cookbooks are so beautiful and glossy that people will think that everything's nice your first food moment is is sort of a, a counter to John not being there it is about corner shops you, you talk about how John when he went into corner shops everybody knew him everywhere and so you were sort of dwarfed by him being known everywhere but you can now go in and claim some spaces that weren't yours before I'm just I'm just in love with corner shops I mean I think we'll talk a little bit later about how much I love foreign supermarkets but I absolutely love corner shops I love London corner shops it's one of the one of the things keeping me in the capital, even though it's crazy expensive and uh, I can't have a garden or any chickens. Um, 
it's corner shops and the massive range of corner shops too. And the way there's this incredible, so I live in Lewisham. I absolutely love Lewisham. I'm a real Lewisham evangelist in South East London. And we've got this thing called the Lewisham Food World Food Centre. And you can buy everything. And it says on the front, it's got a massive list of all the countries where the food comes from. You can go get this fresh Turkish peed. I don't know how you pronounce it. Peed, peed, I don't know. Um, the soft Turkish bread that comes in big, long loaves. Obviously, people on the podcast can't see, but I really am gesturing at a huge <laughs> loaf here. Um, but also things, and so it's like kind of things like that and lots of vegetables that you don't get no baby in the supermarket though you do kind of in the supermarkets around here because they've kind of picked up on the fact there are lots of different cultures and lots of different people buying stuff in Sainsbury's <laughs> but you know you can get like not that I have but you could buy a whole sheep's head yeah. which is you know it's, it's startling to come face to face with a dead sheep I have always been very aware of where food comes from and I feel like sometimes in big supermarkets you can be less aware of that and one reason I really like going to different kinds of butcher shop for instance is because it's like there's a sheep's head and there's its insides and there's its trotters. it's real and it's alive <laughs> or it's not it's real dead, but it's it's part of the process of living and dying which is so much a part of kind of coming get, kind of getting to grips with the idea that death is part of life and life is part of death and they're the same thing and it just keeps going and also i love that you can do that and at the same time you can walk into the corner shop and buy like a big tub of betty crocker frosting i think there's two really <laughs> solid recipes for icing for cakes in this book and am i ever going to use them again i don't know i've just discovered betty crocker frosting and everyone loves it it was also a way for you to travel during the pandemic and for all of us you know using our corner shops you know buying all sorts of wonderful things that we probably wouldn't have seen in the supermarket totally and also uh in corner shops you can buy frozen parathas which are my favorite thing in the world i mean <laughs> I would really struggle being sort of more than 10 minutes away from a frozen paratha. <laughs> but you were able to, to write uh, yourself to Paris and you go to your to Paris in your second food moment, the Paris aubergines. Tell us about writing that reel. So the thing about the Paris aubergines is that they're nothing to do with Paris except that my friend who is called Zelda in the book, so everyone's got a pseudonym. I let everybody choose their favourite name. I said to everyone... Basically everyone, there's some people who've got like a tiny cameo part that I kept their names, but mostly I was like, what did you want to be called? When you were a kid, what did you want to be called? Uh, three of my friends separately were like, oh, Zelda for sure. And I was like, right, I've already got, I've got, I've got Zelda. You're going to have to go for your second choice. But my friend in the, who, her real name is Fiona. Um, she is a fantastic cook. Um, eagle-eyed listeners will remember that there is, her bagel recipe appears in Midnight Chicken. She's a fantastic cook. And I would love her to write a cookbook. But she makes this incredible aubergine thing. And because she lives in Paris, that's what we eat in Paris. So this aubergine, which is like, it's kind of Vietnamese maybe? It's got like fish sauce mm. and lime. It's kind of Southeast Asian in this like very bright way. And you cook like the, cook rice really well. So it's kind of, you, you know, and you can make the rice into little firm bol balls of it. What I wanted to do with this recipe was write about my Paris. So I lived in Paris for a year when I was in my late teens and I lived there with my dear friend and we just had a general ball. So I got really good at supermarkets and clothes. And and then obviously I have friends still in Paris, which means that for me, traveling to France tends to be a thing of, we'll go where they want to go or, so which means Chinese restaurants. It means, you know, Monoprix. So it's a kind of, a different way of looking at the world. And what's nice is that that is how I love to travel best. What I really like is pretending I live somewhere. You know, I went to the seaside, I went to Kent this weekend and I spent the entire time on right move for Kent, even though, as I say, I really like London. Just saying to my flatmate, no, but look, look, look at this one. We could just move now. We could just, we could go to this greengrocer every day. In the end, I had to say, look, I need you to just tolerate me for the rest of this weekend by the sea I'm going to be saying things like I always go to this greengrocer <laughs> you live in your imagination a lot in this book and it feels like very often the recipes are where you land you you know you're you're visiting Paris in your imagination or you might be planning something or but the recipes land you is that what it feels like for you I don't know it's funny when you say that it's very imaginative because I don't think of myself as particularly imaginative you know I find it very difficult to imagine like visual things at all 
I guess that's one reason I write is to kind of imagine stuff. You go to a completely new town and you imagine yourself there. You imagine yourself actually being a part of that grocer's that's community. True. You are totally in your imagination. <laughs> that's, tr- that's true. I think that I just find it very difficult to find a, to see a difference between imagination and reality <laughs> a lot of the time. For me, they are one and the same. And I think that the food I cook then kind of ends up with this quality. The things people say to me a lot when they cook my recipes, oh, I didn't realise you could do that. And it's like, you did know you could do that. You could definitely have got there. And I wonder whether that's part of it as well, is that I'm like, oh, I'll see. That seems like that would work, that those things would go together. Yeah, there's a bit, there's a bit in this book, I think, with popping candy, popping candy on a birthday cake. And a number of people have been like, yeah, wow, popping candy on a cake. And I was like, hmm. You knew that, though. You knew you liked both those things. Um, So, yeah, I guess there is a kind of imaginative quality to it. I think also a lot of us were forced to live in our imaginations for the last couple of years. It's been a lot of... Even people who don't genuinely think of themselves as imaginative people have kind of had to. And I think that when you deprive people of something so fundamental as human contact, there is by necessity, a kind of stretching of the imagination, yes. both to imagine what it will be like after and to reimagine a life now where that's not where that's not going to happen. And I think the same is true of grief, right? You spend a lot of time imagining what grief's going to be like when someone's dying. Probably not if someone dies suddenly, you don't do that. If you do that, you probably have an anxiety disorder. I did that. Um, but when someone is, you love a lot is dying, you spend a lot of time being like, what's going to happen next? It's kind of anxious imagining. And then when it does happen, you're forced to reimagine what your life might look like. You know, I had a very clear idea of what my life was going to look like. You know, I loved this one man and I lived with him and I had lived with him since I was 19 and we had moved in together on our third date. We were, you know, very much, very much a unit. And that was how it was going to be. And the imagination of that was kind of curtailed by this is how life is. Even when he was ill, I was like, well, this is going to be fine because I've imagined it. That's my life. You know, I've chosen what I'm going to do. And then when he did die, I was like, what, what, what am I supposed to do now? (laughs) What does life look like without that? And I think the, the last few months of his life were incredibly difficult and traumatic. He had a brain injury that was really hard to predict and it made everything unpredictable it made his behavior unpredictable it made my reactions unpredictable you know it made his treatment incredibly unpredictable it made his capacity very unpredictable it made what everyone around us was going to do unpredictable and so I was in this thing where I've imagined a whole life for myself and now it's not going to happen and I think we spoke a little bit earlier about fear and I think I um if anything, afraid of accidentally falling into that trap again. Mm. That trap of deciding what my life is going to look like and then having to live up to it for the rest of my life. Life is so long. Mm. Life is so long and full of incredible things that happen. And some of those incredible things are great and some of those incredible things are terrible, but they just keep happening. Yeah. Uh, you know, And they're the miracles you talk about. Those are the miracles. Spring for me is this like incredible miracle. And I know how that sounds. I do know, please believe me if you're listening and thinking jesus yeah okay we get it you are like that every year i'm amazed i'm like looking at these dead trees like there is simply no way i went out yesterday and I was like, there's a tiny little buds on the apple tree it's gonna be fine and i do find that miraculous i find that absolutely staggering it's just things you did nothing to earn yeah i did nothing to earn the fact that it's all gonna come back and i think when you've lost everything really because when John died for kind of complex reasons as I don't really go into in the book because they're complicated and emotional and everyone I guess is just always trying their best I lost loads of our stuff as well our flat went and loads of possessions went loads of our kitchen stuff knives and I really was like well I guess I've got some things but not a ton of things Mm. and starting again starting again kind of practically but also starting again emotionally and starting again with this reimagining of the world does give you a real sense of being like oh yeah I'm great I'm really grateful that this is here and you say that miracles are not born they're made and it 
feels like that that, that narrative arc leads to a, a landing place. If grief is about spinning out of time and seeing things in fractals and memories have different time lines, one day you do land and you and it, you become present. And I wonder if that is the essence of the miracle for you, becoming present. Yes, I think so. I think like you have to shape and create the miracle. You don't really get given miracles very often. I mean, I can't think of, I can't think of very few miraculous events in my life that don't ultimately come down to somebody somewhere did something amazing. Yeah, yeah. John had a lot of miraculous recoveries, which was incredible and was kind of a miracle, was a miracle, but a lot of that came down to the technology was developed to do this thing. Mm -hmm. Or I think the NHS is an absolute miracle. I couldn't get into therapy because the cancer people wouldn't, the cancer like, oh, your family members got cancer, people wouldn't see me because I had tried to kill myself previously and they were like, above our pay grade. And the crisis people who you talk to when you try to kill yourself wouldn't see me because they were like, it doesn't seem like you're depressed. It seems like your boyfriend's got cancer. That seems like a reasonable reason to be stressed. And it was kind of like I fell through the gaps a bit. And so my GP did this miraculous thing where every Monday she would just come in super early to see me for half an hour. Like I had not met this woman before she diagnosed my boyfriend with cancer. Yeah. I cannot fathom how busy she must have been. Mm. She would like come in early to see me to check I was okay and then she moved heaven and earth to get me a counsellor again through the NHS and that counsellor was incredible and wrote me a prescription to have a gin and tonic every day which is still the funniest like prescription I've ever been written and he was just like I don't think you're going to get through this without a drink I don't think you're going to go to sleep with unless you have a drink and I was like you're right but those are miracles right every single step in that process is because people were making active choices to do stuff to make my life better. There's a moment in the summer and it feels like a huge breath of fresh air. Lockdown is over. There's that moment where you can get together and have a party. It's only in your tiny little parking space in your back garden, but it is a glorious party. I wish I'd been there. Tell us about it. It's a three person party, uh, which is me, my flatmate and our, my best friend. So I just bought this unicorn paddling pool, which is, I would say, big enough for one adult to sit in if they're happy for the water to come up to their hips two adults if they're incredibly close friends i'd say three adult women is really pushing it you probably remember that the summer of 2020 was crazy hot it started in yeah. literally april and went on forever mm. and we don't have a hose so i was filling up filling up and down the stairs from our kitchen to the garden Let's see i'm calling it garden um with buckets of cold water and we just, kind of just sat there just <laughs> drinking prosecco eating big sandwiches <laughs> Crisps, crisps and anchovies and focaccia. I, and focaccia which is the recipe in the book which I hope you make because it's really it's super easy it's so easy and it's not like that incredible like puffy focaccia you see on Instagram with the huge bubbles it's kind of richer than that and it makes better sandwiches than that that one tends to kind of crumble and flake this one is like you get the flaky crust but it's got a structure to it I was kind of panicking about that and then I was watching salt fat acid heat you know with them um, some in Nozra. I was like my focaccia looks like that focaccia I am fine because <laughs> she's so wonderful obviously <laughs> yeah so it was this wonderful moment of uh friendship and coming back together and just kind of being in physical contact with someone yeah was so nice it is euphoric it's euphoric and it and it also kind of it in the narrative of the book it it plays a part in kind of popping this sort of very kind of it's I mean it's not a a, a heavyweight book it's really not it's very funny it's beautifully written Thank you. it's very vivid but there's this wonderful moment where everyone's just drinking Prosecco in a unicorn paddling pool it's it's very wonderful the fourth food moment is also very lovely it's about you know you have grown a garden and you've grown apples it, this is your apple crumble custard cake donuts it's all the things that we love in one dish i know there was a long time where i was trying to make them apple crumble custard cream cake donuts but it simply was too many it was too many elements um although there is a crumb in the book and i really recommend that crumb being crushed up custard creams because it is absolutely knockout but it was just a step too far and too much sugar for the dish actually in the book i don't have an apple tree yet and i one of the things that one of the reasons I picked this was because I wanted to boast about my apple tree, as I already have done. Maybe we can circle back to that. It's just this this incredible sense 
that growing apples was something I never thought I'd get to do in London. Eating apples off the tree was such a huge part of my childhood in that I felt, I still feel affronted when I'm like, you want me to pay for an apple? You know, they just grow. (laughs) (laughs) You know, you know how many apples fall off the tree every day? I've talked a lot in this podcast actually about the kind of pull I feel to London and yet this pull to live in other places too, this pull of the countryside and so on. And being able to grow apples and being able to grow things generally has been a huge part of being like, oh, I could do this. There are ways, there are compromises. It doesn't have to be either or. And I think in some ways that is the message of the book, really, is that it doesn't have to be either or. You don't you don't have to pin yourself down. You don't have to say, this is who I am and this is who I'll be forever. And I think it's difficult when writing memoir. Because the process of writing memoir is, as we've said, a process of kind of shaping yourself and shaping yourself into the narrative. But what's crucial for me is that it is always changing. This is a snapshot of a year in my life. And I can't promise it will stay that way forever. I would never want to promise that. I might completely change my mind about everything I've written. That's the fun part. You get to have this, this beautiful writing memoir for me as a process of, have this beautiful moment i have made it i have kept this thing as it was or as i saw it and now what yeah it's interesting you describe yourself as queer and you've talked a lot about sort of traditional and conventional narratives you know if if my daughter's queer so we talk a lot about queer world views and how you see things in a very different way It feels from all the stuff that we've been talking about today that you're saying, you know, don't define me by any one thing. And what's so freeing and what's so miraculous, perhaps, is about actually choice, being able to to write your own story. I just wonder, you know, as somebody who's been defined by the narrative, including, you know, falling in love with two men, what next? How will that queer worldview uh, reflect in, in your next bit of writing? I mean, I think the interesting thing is I don't really think of either of the books as being about... I mean, I'll get to the sort of crux of the question, but I was very surprised that people thought Midnight Chicken was a love story about John. It's about me. (laughs) It's about us. (laughs) And for me, this book is, you know, it's dedicated to Tash, my flatmate, because, you know, she is the kind of... (laughs) She's the point on which my life spins around. You know, we, we share a house. You know, I can't imagine not living with her. If I bought a house, I would buy with her and if we were to stop living together it would be like a divorce in that sense i don't think of this book about as being about my current boyfriend really he's he's an interesting symbol of of life after and moving on in terms of queerness you know i have been in love with a number of people and two of them have been men and the rest of them haven't and i think i don't know it's difficult isn't it it's why i don't really talk about queerness very much because I feel kind of like I'm taking up space that's meant for somebody else I can only kind of say that I've never felt ever 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 felt like restricting who I was in love with because of their gender or sexuality which is you know like it's mad to me it's absolutely mad you know I I know a lot of straight people and they confuse me very much (laughs) I don't understand but in terms of what's next, in terms of what I'm writing, I don't know. I mean, the thing about writing memoir is you've got to wait and see what happens, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> I would like to see what we can do to make different kinds of living possible. I am very lucky to have queer friends. I feel, find my, feel myself totally, totally blessed to have wonderful LGBTQ people around me and people who model for me alternate ways of loving and living and things like being parents in ways that ways that I think maybe you don't see if you are in a very straight community and have very straight friends and so on I find I think probably the queerness is really relevant in that you already know from being a very small person or whenever you first figure it out for me literally my entire life I can't imagine not knowing that the world is gonna you're gonna have to change some things in order to get what you want that you are already outside the rules and i think i really fought against that in my 20s and i think midnight chicken is kind of a fighting against that having had a quite 
queer queer late teens and you know having been in love with all sorts of people and I really fought against it I wanted to be normal I wanted to be like everyone else I wanted to play the game and win by the rules that I knew were the rules because I had fallen in love with a man and I think one of the incredible things about where I am now is that I don't feel that same pressure to live to live necessarily by by that playbook and that doesn't mean I won't but I would like to go into it with my eyes open. You know, like, no one knows the future. I don't know what I'm going to write. You know, cookbook three, maybe I'll get married to a man and have some babies and live in a little cottage and get a puppy. That sounds nice too. I, but I would want to go into it choosing that. And I think that's the key, isn't it? You know, we've talked about making miracles and that really means making choices. It means making choices you're happy with and can live with. And knowing that at any point, everything can change. Thanks for listening. You can read the transcripts to the show at jillysmith.com and click on podcasts. Please get in touch on social media. I'm at Cooking the Books with Jilly Smith on Instagram, where you can follow my adventures in cookery as I spend the next six months at Leith's online. Check the show notes and on Instagram to follow the links to get Cooking the Books discounts on Leith's cookery courses. See you next week.